This is update for October 26, 2022, day 245 of the war, end of the date update. Um, so today I will discuss, uh, as always, uh, first general strategic situation uh, in the world, I guess, and in Ukraine. Uh, and then we're going to do a quick walk through the uh, front line. As a heads up, there is not much uh, going on uh, generally right now. Things are more or less stable and, uh, I would say, uh, all is quiet on the Western f Front in Ukraine uh, for today. Uh, doesn't mean that this is going to continue. Uh, so let's just start with uh, what's going on in the world. Uh, so first of all, uh, let's uh, pick on China. Uh, the situation in China is really economically, first of all, unraveling. Uh, I would say it's a uh, uh, slow motion detonation there. So there was... An, a new statistics came out uh, from China saying that uh, st uh, state budget short for shortfall reached uh, one trillion US dollars um, for the uh, January through September. So it's accumulative for nine months, right? So just uh, it's a it's a huge number by itself. So just for the you know. And, and this is refers to the budgets of all levels, right? So it's regional, you know, general, like the highest level state and, you know, all the, all going all the way to like local governments. <coughs> this is uh, like unprecedented huge number. Uh, and uh, just for the reference, sorry, uh, just for the reference, the size of the economy is 17, uh, you know, 17 to 18 trillion US dollars. Uh, and usually budget is not going to be more than like let's in a normal situation and China is not uh, say not terribly crazy it's about like third uh, maybe 30 percent in better countries 25 percent so uh, you can imagine that this is uh, uh, let's say what's r roughly let's say it's a uh, six uh, trillion out of that uh, you lost uh, one trillion which is uh, 20% uh, well 18% of that um, so you can you can see <coughs> this doesn't happen you know it's because the headlines in the mass media is like oh uh, China is experiencing slow experiencing slowdown no it's not um, experiencing slowdown it's experiencing total uh, implosion uh, that is not terribly visible visible to people who live out, outside of China yet. Uh, another um, data point that confirms this is that uh, Chinese yuan uh, yuan uh, started to uh, fall or depreciate relative to uh, U.S. dollar, which is goes hand in hand, right? So just financial system is just it's a mirror of the real uh, economy, and so <laughs> this state ordered uh, banks to sell us dollars to basically uh, stem the decline of chinese uh, yuan but it's not gonna uh, you know it's not gonna solve the problem obviously right so uh, the reason for this uh, why this is happening is <clears throat> because the uh, consumer is completely over levered or has too much debt in simple way in china they all super invested uh, in this um, real estate bubble and bubble, uh, in, you know, started unraveling um, about a year ago. Actually, more than a year ago. I think September was slow motion unraveling. If you remember, uh, Evergrande um, bankruptcy, and there are more developers. So that was the sort of uh, clear indication that things are completely unraveling. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what that really means is like when uh, that really means that real estate values are going down. And the way um, many regional governments were living in China, they were simply selling land. And, you know, when the prices are going up, you know, you don't need to sell much and, you know, you're getting, you know, what you need um, uh, by selling that land. Uh, now the values are going down, depreciating, uh, and you, you really cannot uh, get those revenues that you were expecting. So this is really uh, goes back to the idea that this, uh, you know, Pumping, pumping up consumer with that by using this real estate, right? Uh, and then creating artificial purchasing power in the hands of consumer, that model is broken and irreparable. 
for now, or at least needs to go through a severe, um, let's say, cleansing or call it uh, recession in, in, in sort of more uh, economic terms. And that's true for, you know, pretty much everywhere. Just China is probably going through that uh, first. Uh, but, you know, the same model works uh, everywhere in, um, in the Western world. Uh, it's not, there is no exception. The same is in Canada, US, uh, UK, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, you know, continental Europe. It's, it's the same model, essentially, basically uh, allowing, you know, uh, real estate values, basically creating, pumping up values of real estate that allows then consumer to have purchasing power by borrowing and spending on consumer goods, which usually would go then to, to China, right? So that's <clears throat> that's whole the whole world is connected in this one system. So what this really means is that it might be first sign that this whole system that as we know, which we call a global economy, might might start to unravel. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow in months, but as you can see, this whole um, implosion that's going on in China it's it's been going on since at least September of last year and probably this is kind of like when the world found out about it right so but probably that implosion has been going on there well before that some I cannot say when but for sure it's uh, you know outside you know, or foreigners see it uh, last let's put this way right so they are least knowledgeable relative uh, to local conditions now let's uh, switch to economic situation in Russia where things are also unraveling in major way. Uh, the retail sales fell depending on the uh, items 30 to 50 percent uh, cumulatively obviously year on year uh, for uh, in Russia. So there is open conversation that many retailers and shopping malls uh, will probably go bankrupt starting, you know, in January or February if things will continue. And there is no reason that to, for things not to continue the same way. So this is, again, uh, Russia the same, has the same, by the way, the same model, right? So levering up um, all of these consumers, you know, going into that and creating this artificial buying power. So that model is... in. Russia is not immune, that that model is broken and everywhere essentially, and Russia uh, included. Um, so that what this really means is they going to be, this also means that there is a uh, huge devastation in the Russian economy happening. It's just not visible, but we start to see those problems uh, when we look at the uh, revenues of the uh, Russian budget. If you remember, I said that at the beginning, you know, in, in spring, uh, Russian budget is in pristine condition and it's run extremely professionally. So uh, I would still say it's the, the people who run the Russian economic side, they run it extremely professionally. I'm not saying that they are the best or the perfect, but rel sort of they are, uh, uh, let's say, least dirty short uh, that I've seen uh, in the world. Uh, and so uh, they run it very well, and this, and they know they know all of these problems. They know how to address it. They really understand um, sort of economy and economics uh, in a true meaning, like uh, you know common sense and and so on. And uh, they still did not manage to avoid the situation, and they and, and they could not. You know, I just want to say it's not in their force, but um, they they can only mitigate. And but the Russian budget uh, revenue started falling down in July. And now it's in uh, essentially very difficult situation because expenses are also going down tremendously because you need to pay a lot of money <clears throat> uh, for the uh, newly minted soldiers uh, that uh, Russia conscri uh, uh, conscripted. So just for the reference, the salary is usually about uh, 205,000 uh, Russian rubles, right? So that's a typical sal uh, salary of the soldier who fights uh, on the ground in uh, Ukraine, depending on the exchange rate, it's between you can say between you know 3.5 uh, to <clears throat> let's say two thousand dollars. It's it's a lot of uh, it's not small money, let's say uh, anywhere, and it's not small money in Russia as uh, as well. So as a result, the budget is uh, in uh, somewhat disarray. However, there was a budget. Uh, there there was a sort of um, the Russian parliament passed the budget in a 
sort of uh, first round discussion. And it's very clear that uh, this uh, economic group that sort of prepared and works on it, they, they try to uh, basically to cut expenses and, and basically have the uh, you know, revenue and expenses roughly uh, you know, within the same level. They cannot have sort of um, uh, surplus now because uh, things are simply unraveling and you cannot, you know, there's not much you can do about it. Uh, but at the same time, they're trying not to create inflation, not to create devaluation and so on. So they extremely, um, um, I would say, keen and aware of the danger that inflation and devaluation, which usually go in hand in hand because it's just uh, two sides of one coin, uh, that um, they try to avoid it because they understand that it leads to social unrest and giving the trash in the war. Uh, there are heavy losses, a lot of, you know, there are a lot of uh, these new conscripts who are dying on the front line. There's a lot of um, tension starting to building uh, to build uh, in the Russian society. And if they create inflation and all the other problems, they just, uh, as I said, uh, it may, uh, you know, this 1917 moment in Russia may happen much sooner than than otherwise. And, and they're fully aware of that. And they try to uh, say, push that moment as far as possible into the future. Mm, most likely, it will probably still will happen. Uh, then uh, related to this, mm, Ukrainian president received a message from, uh, I think, president of uh, Guinea-Bissau. This is a tiny country uh, who came uh, to Ukraine and said uh, that he has message from the Russian president, uh, you know, about the sort of, we need to talk, sort of to say. Uh, to which uh, Ukrainian president declined that, saying no, uh, uh, and that's kind of kind of tells us okay, the problems are getting really serious on the Russian side, and um, you know because they can you know Russian leadership can you know project next uh, you know six six months where it's going to be, and they really re understanding that um, the economy cannot afford the war. Essential, and as I said, it will lead to a 1917 moment in Russia. So they they testing the water to see if there is opportunity for peace negotiation. Uh, so we'll see where you know this is, was just a sort of uh, I'd say first uh, uh, stone thrown in the water. Uh, we'll see where it goes, uh, but so far it the, the, the both sides just want to kind of. Uh, kind of summarize where both sides are standing and the problem um, is that both sides are way too far apart for Ukraine uh, the territorial integrity is non-negotiable um, and that's a problem for Russia especially it has a vested interest uh, uh, with Crimea where it was you know there's a there's, there's the problem is that Russian leadership is in a way hostage of its own propaganda. There was a lot of propaganda about Crimea, about sort of, you know, uh, how to say, recapturing and, um, you, know, ten, you know, gaining control of Crimea, how wonderful it is and so on. So um, population is very sort of brainwashed. And now if you sort of kind of say, okay, well, goodbye Crimea, uh, there will be a first of all shock in that brainwashed population uh, and then as a result of that there will be huge psychological discomfort and it may again blow you know turn into some kind of coup and then it will lead to as i said 1917 moment so again so that's so that's why i say russian leadership is in a way hostage uh, of itself of its own actions since 2014 uh, and the Ukrainian side simply does not accept, uh, uh, you know, anything but this uh, full territorial in integrity. Uh, the problem with the Ukrainian side that it, it's um, it's not trying to sort of like see compromise in terms of let's say dropping EU, dropping NATO, uh, and sort of kind of trying to be neutral sort of country or state uh, as a concession. Uh, uh, to the Russian side, so that's where that's where the whole sort of big problem is, and um, you know, 
apparently Bo, you know, let's say Russian side needs to go through more pain and uh, Ukrainian side will go through more pain before uh, they will start sort of uh, discussing sort of maybe the scenarios that I, that I was just describing where, um, you know, Ukraine gets in territorial integrity uh, and uh, Russia will get sort of neutral Ukraine on its borders. Um, we'll see if that's uh, that's uh, the sort of let's say compromise that satisfies at least to some point um, interest of both parties because uh, you know Ukraine gets everything back whatever it lost uh, and you know continues it, its life and so on uh, while Russia also will not get sort of super uh, sort of I'd say stressed out about uh, you know as they claim you know Western troops on their borders and so on uh, even though this is actually kind of false claim the real interest is really uh, you know ability to pump natural gas uh, to to Europe and uh, from the Russian side and, and to remain monopoly but that whole thing at this point is gone um, and so that's um, that's sort of out of question. But nevertheless, military part uh, re uh, remains. And given that Russia understands that they are fighting with essentially a uh, uh, Western coalition, right, where uh, West is supplying Ukraine with financial resources and military resources, and Ukrainian population is uh, extremely determined uh, to... Uh, protect itself and protect the country. So in this situation, essentially Russia is in the corner. Uh, and so that's a situation where it's going to eventually uh, kind of go is uh, remains to be uh, seen. Uh, and as a small kind of like number, small just data point on Russia in terms of its uh, energy production, so the natural gas production fell 12 percent cumulatively for nine months of this year first nine months um, to 428 um, uh, billion cubic meters uh, just uh, if you remember i mentioned yesterday uh, europe consumes 400 400 billion so just just to kind of like gives you magnitude of the numbers and russia supplies to europe up to 200 billion used to supply per year so um so you can see and the rest russia basically converts into fertilizers right uh and uh, all sorts of all other chemicals and essentially that's being exported in sort of more uh, vo more value added form as opposed to just uh, uh, very basic uh, uh, raw material uh, now let's actually walk through the, um, oh, actually uh, another one more piece of information. Uh, so first of all, in terms of um, in attacks on energy infrastructure, um, it was quite day to day, no, it's no any large attacks. Um, and uh, Ukraine is now testing ability to actually buy electricity uh, from uh, Slovakia, but I mean, it's from the whole like European uh, system essentially it's not Slovakia it's just uh, it's just uh, how to say entry point into European system is uh, Slovakia so uh, there is um, so apparently Ukraine will uh, uh, try to import uh, electricity but again this goes back to the problem that uh, the distribution system that's where that's what Russian side is attacking distribution system so even though Ukraine sort of trying to do that, it's not going to work out uh, because uh, Russia again can um, can target all of those tra uh, trans uh, transformers uh, in the uh, western part of the country and essentially cut, cut off. Uh, basically, as I said before, uh, disintegrate the you know unified um, uh, system into islands, uh, which. Uh, they probably will continue doing. Uh, it's just uh, n unclear why they paused for this couple days, but uh, it's pretty sure if the war continues, then this will continue. Uh, now let's actually jump uh, to the uh, walk through the front line. Uh, the situation uh, along the state border was 
uh, pretty quiet at, well not totally quiet but relative to intensity like you know three four days ago it's fairly quiet uh, now let's uh, look what's going on on uh, North Luhansk uh, front line. Things here are uh, more or less stable. Uh, Russian side was reporting that Ukrainian troops uh, again tried to attack here uh, near Kuzeminka without much success. So, so far we can say that at this point situation is uh, stable. Uh, and I would say simply Russia has enough troops. There is enough density at this point due to um, you know conscripts uh, so the front line essentially stabilized at this point and uh, what this really means uh, from let's actually move uh, from the long-term perspective is that um, Ukrainians Ukrainians ability to do offensives is extremely limited uh, for the following reason a um, Russia has uh, more troops and will have many more troops on the ground, right? So just more soldiers. So it it, it just um, you know uh, it 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 changes the balance of power uh, from Ukrainian advantage to essentially no advantage because for those who let's say joined relatively recently, uh, so you need to be aware that Ukraine uh, significantly outnumbers uh, Russia in terms of a number of soldiers on the ground right so where ukraine is or used to be uh, lacking is heavy equipment uh, russia was dominating uh, in heavy equipment now situation uh, has changed somewhat not in tanks not in uh, you know uh, ife so all those but in terms of artillery uh, ukraine still has fewer artillery pieces but ukraine has a lot of uh, super uh, potent and precise um, rocket systems and artillery pieces that Russia does not have and that really created the balance uh, in, at least in artillery and uh, and that balance essentially um, that A initially allowed Ukraine to successfully uh, counterattack right so we all saw like you know Ukraine uh, liberated this part of um, uh, this um, Kharkiv region and then part of uh, Kherson region uh, but now that and that was two as I said two 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 factors first um, <laughs> advantage in artillery at least uh, in certain areas and um, um, in certain uh, types of artillery right and by that I broadly mean including rocket systems like HIMARS uh, and then number of troops, simply uh, number of people on the ground, right? So when you outnumber, it's it's hard to defend, and that's what's going on with the Russian army. Now that that situation is over, uh, and uh, you know Ukraine still uh, somewhat dominates the uh, Russia uh, in terms of artillery, but it's not enough uh, in general strategically to uh, change the situation to allow Ukraine to. Uh, continue successfully uh, advancing on the negative for Ukraine side it's completely lack of 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 uh, you know offensive skills right it's it's done in the most inefficient brutal uh, the worst the worst uh, way you can do it so it's extremely um, resource intensive and, and, and the first and the most important is human lives obviously uh, and and so it leads to a lot of losses the way it's being done uh, well it was the exception of the Kharkiv area it was actually because the Russian troops were so outnumbered that it simply collapsed collapsed like a like a like a pocket of cards like a house card uh, but in Kherson it wasn't an easy walk by any means uh, and it was uh, quite a bit of losses there so um, again so for now since uh, Russia is pumping up number of soldiers they also bring some equipment. It's obviously not a match to uh, modern artillery system, but nevertheless, it's you know it still you know shoots uh, uh, artillery shells, and though if you you know send enough, eventually they will kill someone. Uh, so this creates kind of like a balance of power where um, the Ukrainian side is not able to uh, continue offensives unless it gets you know again some kind of advantage. Right, so advantage can be, for example, 
the skills, you know, like know how to do offenses at all levels, starting from the soldier and, uh, you know, finishing with a general who plans it right. So, and that's lacking. And that's what's actually in Ukraine's, I would say, ability to fix on its own. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, that's not being done. Because uh, the advantage in the number of people and the manpower is probably gone sort of for good, right? Because from the very beginning it was clear Russian population is 3.5 times more than Ukrainian. And so uh, Ukraine cannot rely on, um, on the number of soldiers as a sort of way to take advantage of, the, you know, to, to basically to gain advantage in the situation, in the fight. Uh, so it remains to be seen for how, you know, this balance of power may, may remain uh, for a while and uh, this may uh, mean that the front line may become really static for a long time. Uh, still uh, maintain the, the point that uh, Kherson bridgehead will be lost uh, for the Russian side uh, regardless, just simply because it's essentially cut off by Dnipro River from the rest of the you know Russian troops and so on. So this is going to be lost one way or another, just a question of time, whether it's going to be uh, in a month or two weeks or five days or you know in 60 days, I'm clear, but it, simply because of the Dnipro River Russian site and HIMAR systems and just generally precision artillery, uh, Russian site will not be able to uh, keep you know to hold on to it uh, for the long term. Uh, now let's actually move to, uh, but the rest of the front line, sorry, just um, jumping a little bit, uh, but the rest of the front line uh, will likely remain uh, sort of stable and for how long we'll see, uh, it's very unclear. Uh, now let's jump to um, North and Bas front line, things here uh, are the same. Uh, just quick update, there was Ukrainian attack here towards Zlotarivka. Apparently, uh, as I said, uh, I think yesterday, uh, Russian, it was a dangerous situation, but Russian troops managed to sort of control the situation and um, did not lose the ground uh, and kept their defensive positions. Uh, that was quiet on this northern section. Again, the same kind of areas of attacks, the Solidar, Bakhmut, uh, and then, you know, area... The, where Russian uh, troops are especially active is this area um, south of Bakhmut, which obviously you, you can understand that's uh, where they you know advanced and really creating a uh, problem for Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut. Um, but so far there was no, no advances uh, today. Uh, now let's uh, move to uh, central Donbass front line. Things here are more or less the same, the same kind of like Axis of attack. So as you can see, this is uh, toward direct. This attacks directed towards Avdiivka, creating, you know, trying to create again this um, uh, untenable situation in terms of encirclement and force, uh, force uh, squeeze out of Ukrainian troops from Avdiivka, uh, and the same purpose uh, of this um, uh, Pisky salient, which becomes sort of like longer and longer stretch towards west, and uh, at the same time. It's the, the 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 sides of it or flanks are you know still you know Ukrainian troops are still there and uh, uh, eventually there could be some uh, you know small scale attack to cut it off but uh, the ability to sort of grow it more further uh, northwest is becoming sort of limited because you need to uh, increase the base of it uh, and so. So it's kind of like might be that it's going to self, I would say, stop on its own because uh, because the Russian, needs, Russian forces need to increase base. They may try to do that. So it might and they may, might be successful, but it uh, doesn't look so. Uh, and then all these attacks uh, in Marin, Kanon, Kharkiv and never lead to anything there as well. Uh, now let's quickly check the Parisia front line. Things here are... Uh, quiet and stable, nothing major here. Uh, let's uh, finish with Kherson bridgehead. Since here also uh, quite stable, no major changes. Uh, continued Ukrainian attacks against uh, the Russian uh, supply lines. They uh, a little bit, you know, lower in number and scale today, and 
probably less successful. Um, but uh, it looks like Ukrainian side continues uh, those uh, attacks. That's it for today. Thanks for watching and until tomorrow. Bye-bye.